this is a topic, uh, and I guess if I could best introduce it, I, I call it the role of sorcery and drugs in opening the last day spirit portal. That's how it was presented at the last day's conference this past April in Nashville. Um, but it really was initiated based on a chance story we reviewed on Future Quake, uh, probably around the end of 2008, uh, regarding this chemical DMT, uh, which I will talk about here more so in just a minute. But it had some mysterious history to it, not only as a uh, hallucinogenic chemical or psychoactive chemical, but its religious connotations to it. And this really intrigued me. It was an area I had not really looked into. I've, I've not been one that had a history of partaker of drugs, even alcohol. So I really didn't know much about this material other than, than what's known to the general public. Um, that led to some more research on my behalf and more interest in, in doing sort of a foundational show Back around January 2009, I uh, invited Dr. Lynn Marzulli to set in as part of our discussion of, of my research on DMT and similar drugs. And uh, at various times, uh, I've taken an interest in furthering and advancing my, my research in this area. And I'm getting more and more convinced all the time that this is an area that all people uh, need to be aware of, particularly the Christian community, uh, because we've been very lax in understanding uh, what what goes on in this concept of sorcery and the role of drugs and the spiritual implications itself. And that's really the context of my talk. So if you don't mind, I'm going to proceed further. And uh, please uh, Chris, please feel free to interrupt, uh, interject, ask questions whenever you like along the discussion as we go here. Okay, great. Uh, the, the whole purpose of this talk, and just to give you a little heads up here, is to educate, first of all, on some history of sorcery and drugs uh, in spirit contact, in use in spirit contact, both from secular and biblical records. Try to explain the impact of sorcery activities in the modern era as well, too, which is a, another fascinating topic. And from there, reveal some current developments uh, in the revival of interest in sorcery today. And then uh, proceed to propose some hypotheses on how these activities can actually fulfill Bible prophecy. Uh, and conclude with some suggested activities today that I think may fulfill the model, the prophetic model that uh, I will propose. And then close by recommending some action to actually address this threat. So uh, moving into the body of it, I, I first need to clarify some definitions for people of some terms that they may not be familiar with. Uh, the concept of the, of the word or term theurgy, uh, and I'm going to give you a definition here, it's the practice of rituals, sometimes seen as magical in nature, performed with the intention of invoking the action or presence of one or more gods, especially the goal of uniting with the divine, achieving henosis or perfecting oneself. And henosis, henosis relates to having a union with what is fundamental in reality, the one, the source, or monad. So... Uh, uh, it's it's a key purpose uh, of conjuring these particular spirits to achieve a desired spiritual end state. Uh, now, there's two types uh, of this. One is called invocation. And invocation is best defined as a form of possession. Uh, and this is where an individual's normal personality is replaced by another. Uh, this would be the kind of thing you would see when channeling occurs, when you see this spirit comes on someone. Uh, another definition is to draw a spirit within one's body or within one's own body. Uh, even sh shamans do this. Uh, medicine men, shamans, uh, Wicca uh, practice this activity. The other approach is evocation, and that is calling or summoning a spirit, demon, god, or other supernatural agent uh, is the definition. And even Aleister Crowley, uh, who is well known to anyone who studies the areas of the occult, uh, he has his own definition just to distinguish between the two. He says to invoke is to, quote, call in, uh, just as to evoke is to call forth. Now, in invocation, the, the macrocosm floods the consciousness, so the outer spirit world comes in you. In evocation, the magician, having become the macrocosm, creates a microcosm. So um, in his in his view or understanding, the magician becomes the controlling universe, and then is able to summon forth gods. So you will hear invocation and evocation all the time. But invocation, they come in, they sort of take you over, they speak through you, for example. Evocation is when they actually appear or manifest themselves in some form before you. Another term people need to understand is what this word sorcery means. 
Uh, sorcery, if you look in a simple definition, for example, in Wikipedia, it'll, it's called a, the manipulation of magic. Uh, but I'm very interested in what the ancient world says, and particularly the Bible. In the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew word, uh, it's keshef, I believe it's a pronunciation, and it relates to sorcery or witchcraft. Uh, in the New Testament, there are actually two words that are used. One is mageo, and that means to be a magician or to practice magical arts. Uh, but the one I'm really interested in the most is, is the term pharmakeia. And pharmakeia is the use or the administering of drugs uh, involved in sorcery, magical arts, and often in connection with idolatry and fostered by it. So drugs are a key connection, and obviously you see the word pharmacae and its connection to pharmacy, and what we know is uh, administering of drugs. Uh, and the last term I just want to make sure people are clear on is this term shamanism. Uh, and probably a simple definition is shamans are intermediaries between the human and spirit worlds. So uh, these are a very, very ancient form of, of people that do this particular function itself. Now, just to give you a couple examples that we have in the ancient literature where these events occurred, if you go back and look at the book of First Enoch. Now, First Enoch, if your listeners are not aware of that, is a book that uh, some consider um, writing that is worthy of consideration as being factual and accurate. Um, it is quoted in the Bible, in the book of Jude, and elsewhere in the Bible, which gives it very special consideration. It, uh, the Book of Enoch has been kept in the canon of the Ethiopian Church since its earliest days, one of the earliest uh, segments of the, of the church body. So it's something that's considered in great esteem. Uh, some portions of it, particularly as you get later sections that may have been written at a later date, uh, cause more concern and conjecture. But anyway, First Enoch is held in great esteem, and it talks a good bit about what happened when these angels, 200 angels, came down uh, to cohabitate with women in the days before the flood. And, and this event is alluded to in Genesis chapter 6, as well as, uh, again, uh, in Jude and a few other places in the New Testament. Um, but uh, a couple of these uh, people, and, and these are in foreign tongues, so I'm not often able to completely pronounce them correct, but Simjaza, uh, and Amaros were two of these leaders. In fact, some Jaws is considered uh, possibly the lead, ring leader of these angels who, as the Bible says, left their first estate and came down to cohabitate with women. Uh, it says that later they were judged for this at the time of the flood and were actually imprisoned uh, in a special place called Tartarus. But one of the things that the Book of Enoch says that they did was they taught mankind enchantments and root cuttings. Now, enchantments is a key word as used in the Bible because it relates to using this drug-related sorcery. And root cuttings are basically using the kind of things like you, you associate or connotate with classical witchcraft, where you, where you t get these roots and cut them out and make potions and spells and things like this. So it suggests that there was an effort made by the dark forces to take the initiative to contact mankind uh, and to introduce them and teach them these techniques. Now, one of the uh, most venerated um, godlike characters in all of recorded history is Isis. Uh, Isis, uh, the the goddess of Egypt, which was which was uh, a goddess whose worship was continued throughout the Greek and Roman era as well. She was probably the most uh, robust uh, religious figure to maintain support. Uh, even as new uh, kingdoms came along. Um, she was the uh, goddess of magic, uh, and again, followed in Egypt and later in Greece and Rome. Uh, in the story, the main story involving Isis is that she was actually married to her brother Osiris. And Osiris was confronted uh, by Seth, or Seth, Seth is the correct term. And in their battle... Um, Seth was able to uh, destroy him and actually cut him up and send him away. And uh, Isis was able to actually use her magic techniques to gain extra power from Ra and others as a means by which to reassemble Osiris and basically rescue him from the underworld of death. So she was able to get him from, from, from underground in the underworld, bring him back, uh, and then, of course, helped birth uh, Horus, uh, which was really a a reincarnation according to the mythology of 
of Osiris itself. But it's key to remember that these were uh, were brother and sister figures who were also had this relationship, and also that she took the initiative to rescue him from the un- underworld and release him. Now she has uh, temples at places like Delos, which actually were where the temples for Artemis and Apollo are. And uh, if you study the literature, you will find uh, that her image, her attributes are uh, actually associated with Artemis uh, and a few other mythological fig- uh, figures that have, in essence, the same description. Another uh, uh, one, and by the way, Artemis and Apollo that I mentioned, in like manner, are brother and sister figures as well. Hecate is a, another mythological figure from the ancient days. Uh, she was the Greco-Roman goddess of magic and witches. Uh, she also, uh, the analyst of these ancient uh, mythologies say, is, is really related uh, in worship to Isis and to Artemis as well. But she was a clear-cut uh, goddess that uh, was associated with witchcraft, magic, and similar things we'll see here in just a moment. Now, uh, as far as the sorcerers, uh, sorcerers throughout history that use these techniques of theurgy, of invocation, evocation, uh, probably the earliest ones we have are the shamans, which are known as medicine men or, or witch doctors, whatever you might call them, uh, around the world, usually with indigenous people that go back as far as we have any kind of records, back millennia, where they would actually function on behalf of the local tribe or village uh, and they had these drugs and other kind of techniques by which they could somehow make communication with higher intelligences, uh, what they called gods, to be able to receive information for medicine, for healings, for things like this for the tribe. Uh, and, and they're well known for that across whether you, you talk about Eskimos or Central America or other places. Uh, amongst the Western, uh, more modern world, one that really stands out is Dr. John D. Uh, Dr. John Dee was actually the magician and chief think tank in the uh, court of Queen Elizabeth uh, in Elizabethan England. Uh, he was probably the most the smartest man in the world. Uh, it, it has been said he had the largest library in the entire world at the time. Um, but uh, And he also considered himself a Christian, and that's a very curious matter. But at the same time, he had such a thirst and zeal for knowledge and he wanted so much to know what what uh, what about nature, about how the world worked, about other facts, that uh, he took the the activity to contact angel angelic spirits to be able to obtain more knowledge. And he used a technique called scrying, or basically using a crystal ball. And he had another gentleman who actually assisted him, Edward Kelly, I believe is his name, who actually assisted him in uh, making these views from the crystal ball and then making contacts with angels. And the recordings recorded all sorts of information about nature, about science, and there's even indication possibly the new world was communicated through this activity. Uh, and, and while Dr. D considered himself a Christian, um, these beings over time began to say things that were not supportive of a Christian worldview, like you should not pray to Jesus, you should not worship him, and things like this. It terrified his uh, his uh, cohort so much that he quit and actually left. He was really a broken man from this uh, contact. But Dr. D continued on because of his thirst for knowledge and really compromising his spiritual beliefs. And one major contribution he made was something called Enochian language, and uh, Enochian magic. Uh, and and this was written in something called the Keys of Enoch. And it's something who's, who's actually had its uh, re- uh, emergence, reemergence in the 20th century itself. Now, in fact, one person who was key in doing that was Aleister Crowley. Uh, Aleister Crowley uh, was really the preeminent uh a magician, sorcerer of the 20th century. I, I think he's without peers, undisputed, uh, as, as the key in advancing occult knowledge, language, uh, in doing workings itself. It's very curious that, uh, uh, his deity encounters that he claimed to have in the presence of other people first was from a homosexual experience that he had and went right into a particular experience. Uh, I'm studying more about his background right now, but there are a number of characters uh, from the spirit world that he claims to have contacted him. One was called Iwas and uh, dictated to him something called the Book of the Law. Later one was called Lamb 
and uh, he he's drawn pictures of Lamb. This is back in the teens, 19 te- teens, and the picture looks remarkably what we associate with alien greys today. Uh, but he taught ceremonial magic as well as the ritual use of drugs, and he was a very big proponent of drug taking as a way to bridge the gap to be able to make this contact with the with the spirit world, both at his Abbey of Thelema where he uh, liberally gave away drugs and uh, even his own addictions that he had as well to it. Another gentleman I can mention from the 20th century that played a critical role was someone by the name of Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons is one of the most little-known people in American history, but one of the most disturbing uh, persons in background. He was really the father of the American space program. He, he is undisputed. In fact, if you ask, ask Werner von Braun or others, they will point to Jack Parsons as the key person to result in, in our space program. Uh, he uh, not only made our first rockets that were used in World War II, but he founded uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He founded the Caltech rocket program. Uh, the rocket company Aerojet, for example, was founded by him. But he was a full-blown occultist. Uh, he called himself the Antichrist. And when they would perform rocket tests, either for academia or for the federal government, he would invoke ceremonies of the god Pan whenever he would do his experiments and tests. And he took on the mantle and ran the occult group, the main occult group in America out of Southern California, and was in direct correspondence with Aleister Crowley and really was seen as his protege. Uh, and he developed a, a group of scientists literary people and others that would do these dark occult practices in his home, uh, scare scare neighbors and other people, uh, even famous actors like uh, uh, John Carradine uh, participated in these activities. Uh, but it, it became an issue with the, with the FBI as they were watching these things. The thing he's most famous for is something called the Babylon working. And what these sorcerers do, when they, they do a major effort to evoke an evocation of a spirit, they call it a working. And in the Babylon working, he wanted to produce the great whore Babylon that would be, uh, materialize and make itself manifest in this world. Uh, and so it could be a consort for the Antichrist in this world. And this activity was done in January 1946 with none other than his assistant L. Ron Hubbard, who was later known uh, to found the Scientology uh, religion. Uh, but they worked together and did this effort, and according to their reports, they had another assistant, a woman by the name of Marjorie Cameron, and they uh, claimed that they actually witnessed uh, a manifestation of the spirit into the world through their activities itself. So this is just a sample of a few of the people who, in the modern era, have fulfilled this role and well-known. And I would like to just mention here, for, for lack of a better place, this is a little addendum here, uh, I'm of the sneaking suspicion that the person today who probably best fits the mantle of Aleister Crowley, who passed away, ironically, in 1947, right in the middle of, of a, a period of time that was very interesting from a spiritual and biblical standpoint, a time with the Roswell sightings occurring at that time, the founding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the refounding of the Book of Enoch, uh, just before the uh, uh, founding of the Nation of Israel. Uh, but, but since his time, I believe that his mantle probably most likely fits on, of all people, the the uh, author, uh, comic book uh, impresario, um, Alan Moore. Uh, Alan Moore was the author of uh, a comic book series called Watchmen uh, that is considered classical literature beyond the comic book phase. And uh, sometime, Chris, if you'd like to have me back, I, I believe there's embedded within that an occult eschatology or occult view uh, symbolic of what they see the end times are going to be. Uh, he also conducted V for Vendetta, uh, was another uh, uh, series he did as well. And he had a cohort. He had his own predecessor called Steve Moore. And they together actively pursued the use of drugs uh, and other sorcery by which to contact spirit entities according to their own, uh, uh, according to their own word. So uh, I, I think this, this tradition of sorcerers is still continuing today. Okay, um, now, in the Bible, just to give you some examples of what the Bible might say about it, uh, the Witch of Endor is one case of, of sorcery activity going on in 1 Samuel 28. Uh, Saul uh, had done a number of things at this time in history that were counter to God's will. Uh, he was in great jeopardy. Um, 
In fact, uh, he, he had really lost God's blessing because of not doing what God had described him to do. At the same time, he had lost his, his main associate, the, the, uh, the priest Samuel, uh, who was really his main advisor from God, and he felt totally helpless. He was in desperate uh, distress and uh, had to seek out someone who could attempt to contact a dead Samuel to get advice about an upcoming battle. Uh, he had already chased the sorcerers out of Israel, uh, as he was instructed to do, so they had to go find another one uh, just outside the, the area at Endor to use. And uh, so when uh, they used her services, um, she says at the process when this was ongoing, she saw gods coming up from out of the earth. And that was the, the thing she saw. And and f in reasons that I can't fully explain what happened, for some reason it appears that she was permitted to bring forth Samuel uh, for a special purpose. And this purpose was to send a message to Saul that, that he was doomed and that his life would be taken from him in this upcoming battle. Uh, but this process occurred, and in fact it seemed as if even she was startled uh, at his appearance uh, and suddenly realized that uh, Saul was in her presence who had disguised himself. So that was a sort of a classic event of a sorcery event. Then we have a character in the New Testament by the name of Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer, uh, at the time of the book of Acts, had an entire town spellbound by his sorceries. Uh, they were pretty much entirely under his will. Uh, however, uh, to some extent, he had succumbed to the message of the gospel. And uh, he proceeded and was baptized, um, but he fully did not understand the full nature of what it meant to uh, be become a disciple of Christ uh, because he tried to buy the Holy Spirit uh, from the apostles. And he he thought this, I guess, looking back on his, on his old days as a sorcerer, um, where you actually had to put money down to gain new, new information, new gnosis, new magical power. He saw the work of the Holy Spirit and he wanted it. Uh, for whatever reason, um, but he was, as as you can imagine, he was chastised for this and uh, severely rebuked. And ironically, he was told he was the uh, of the wormwood of hatred for this. And I want you to remember that word, wormwood and hatred, because they are associated together. They do have a later connection to sorcery, I believe. Now, another very harrowing event, also in the Book of Acts was regarding uh, worshippers in Ephesus of the goddess Diana, which is the same goddess uh, is known in Greek as Artemis, uh, someone who we'll be talking about shortly. Um, the, the whole town basically uh, was devoted to the worship of, of Diana. Uh, when Paul uh, and others came in preaching the gospel, many turned instead to Christ uh, and caused a major revolt, particularly by the idol makers. Uh, which were the people who were making money off of the support uh, of worship of her. And they brought the people there into a citywide chaos of, of wrath. The word wrath is used there, of thymos, uh, which is described from that passage as a passion, angry heat, glow ardor, wine of passion, uh, which either drives the drinker mad or kills him with its strength. So that, that's the definition from Strong's Concordance of the word used there. Uh, we're, we're not talking about just a general run-of-the-mill anger, something that was a rage that would uh, either drive someone mad or, 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 or kill the person uh, because of this. So that I think there was something spiritual going on. And those in your audience who are familiar with Pastor Russ Dizdar and his discussion about an upcoming black awakening where uh, massive numbers of people are going to have uh, possibly submerged demonic personalities called forth have been placed for a future day or hour. Their kind of activity of chaos sounds similar to what happens in this passage. Uh, and in this discussion of Diana, they mention that an image of her that was in their temple there locally had fallen from heaven. So they had this, uh, this idea of her being in the heavens and falling down uh, into the temple itself. And, and I just want to tell your listeners to keep these elements in mind because we're, they're going to be cited again. Uh, later in Revelation 18, there's a very, very important passage that uh, many people gloss over, Bible teachers and others. Uh, in that passage, if, if you read it, you will find very clearly that the kings of the earth and the great merchants of the earth conspire, to get, conspire together, and it says they do sorcery, and the word used there is pharmakia, uh, which is the use of drugs, 
uh, to control the activities of the world. And it says through this they deceive the nations of the earth. Uh, which is a very, very powerful passage and describes a lot of what is talked about on Internet radio shows today about the deception of our world systems and institutions uh, over the, the populace, over their control of, of uh, food and drugs and things like this. Well, that's right out of the pages of the Bible, I believe, and I think this passage makes it clear that there is a consortium of, of uh, government officials as well as people that are in the business, in the commercial business, and they find it to their mutual advantage of control to make use of sorcery, which involves these use of drugs and also through dark spiritual powers. And the net effect is they're able to deceive uh, large portions of the world public uh, in their process of this uh, communication. Now, just going into some details of some of these uh, chemicals that we're talking about, some of the more common ones. Uh, and, and these chemicals uh, would probably be best described by the term entheogens, which are drugs which do something to, to your psychosis, your spirit, to enable you to overcome any barriers to make direct contact with spirits in the spirit world. And some of the natural substances include something like, I, I believe it's pronounced psilocybin, uh, it's, it's basically known as magic mushrooms. It's the ingredient in the hallucinogenic mushrooms. We have another chemical called scopolamine, uh, which is also uh, uh, in, enclosed in, in chemicals like, uh, or, or plants, natural growing plants like belladonna, henbane, witch's herb, uh, and even something called angel's trumpets, which is very ironic given a later reference we're going to make here. Um, DMT. Uh, and its use in a blended form in ayahuasca tea made by the shamans uh, in the Amazon area. And then we have mescaline, uh, which comes from uh, peyote and uh, similar sources like this in Central America. Now, there, there are man-made chemicals. We have not been satisfied with the natural uh, entheogens. Uh, man has decided to make his own uh, more concentrated versions. And some of these are uh, things like LSD. Uh, chemical DMX, which I'll, I'll mention more just in a moment, and even commonplace alcohol, uh, in certain cases, does a very effective role as an entheogen. Now, uh, just to comment on two of these, um, dextromethorphan, or DMX, uh, believe it or not, it's just used as a, the, the key ingredient in common cough suppressants. If you go to the drugstore and look for your cough suppressants, they're going to have a DMX DM uh, symbol typically on them. Uh, unfortunately, according to news reports that are out, uh, it is widely misused as a psychotropic drug by at least 3.1 million Americans. And that's just young Americans that are using this very common over-the-counter drug, uh, taking it in portions that will actually create some kind of spiritual contact. And the reports I have said that they've documented entity contacts, out-of-body experiences and other paranormal events by use of the simple chemical that we have in our own drug cabinets. Now, scopolamine uh, was used actually in early forms of Percodan, uh, and now it's being used for uh, various depression drugs right now. So it's it's a common use for this. Uh, it was used by shamans in their Burundanga plants, a uh, plant where they used it for their contact with the spirit. Um, it is now considered, its its usage is, is, is a virtual epidemic in Colombia, in similar places right now, and it's actually been used as a robbery device where people will be slipped this drug and uh, actually be robbed or have other things done to them without their memory, where they lose their memory of it. Um, and, and it's been described that when people use it recreationally, it will create what they call realistic psychic events. So not just a simple hallucination of, of my, my, my head deceived me on what I saw, but uh, something much more realistic. Um, and this particular chemical has traditionally been used by witches and sorcerers to see their gods. So th th these kind of uh, uh, key roots and plants like we referred to that the early angels taught mankind has been used since then, this information preserved uh, for them to make their spirit contacts as well. Now, one I'd like to focus on a little bit is, is one called dimethyltryptamine, or better known, DMT. Uh, DMT uh, is uh, present and naturally occurring in plants in the Amazon Basin area. Uh, it's very popular with shamans in that area. And they, they make it in um, 
something called ayahuasca tea, and this maximizes the effectiveness in it. Now, uh, this particular chemical is made in various parts of the body. Some have theorized that it's actually produced in the human pineal gland, which we'll speak about in just a moment. But um, in, in any case, it's made within the body. Uh, unfortunately, uh, well, or fortunately, however you see it, um, there is are other enzymes that are actually in your gastrointestinal tract that will actually quickly dissipate its presence in the body. And these are called, uh, I believe, monoamine oxidase uh, enzymes, or M- M- MAO. Uh, and what happens is you need to take something called an MAOI, or MAO inhibitor, uh, chemical that will actually stop these enzymes from breaking it down. And that's, in fact, what is put in ayahuasca tea. Uh, the other ingredients that are added uh, do this uh, MAOI function of inhibiting the breakdown of it and allow it to go through your body and your brain for even a multi-hour uh, mystical experience. Uh, and DMT is one particular chemical that has earned a reputation for very reliable contact of the spirit world. Uh, virtual 100% uh, incidents of a deep uh, spirit contact with taking the chemical, and usually within seconds uh, for for many cases such as intravenous use. Just to give you one example of what a DMT experience would be like, there was a National Geographic magazine columnist that went to the Amazon to, quote, experience DMT uh, and take it along with the shamans in this ayahuasca tea. And she had stated in the in the article that she basically was an atheist, so she had a lot of uh, skepticism about these spiritual aspects. But what happened was when she actually took it in their little circle where they, they pass it around and take it, she said she experienced, and this is just a summary, she was falling down this deep chasm or abyss and surrounded by souls that were crying out to her, that were reaching out with her arms uh, and crying out and, and asking, pleading for help, that, they would, that she would get them out of where they were, were stuck or kept. And she landed in the bottom of this pit and saw three thrones that were enthroned with figures on them, and she was absolutely terrified for her life. She could sense the evil and hate, and uh, they said that you are doomed here, you'll never leave, there is no hope, there's no way out of here. And one of the curious things about this particular drug, uh, unlike just a garden variety hallucinogen, is that communal experiences seem to be possible with this drug, where people experience a common reality. And according to her narrative there, a couple other people who were more experienced that had taken the drug actually intervened in her incidents and brought her out of this particular event. And it's very interesting that uh, having a reputable uh, group like National Geographic actually published this uh, and, and someone who really was not promoting the drug per se, but she makes some pretty far out claims that, for example, that as soon as that incident was over, she began throwing up and threw up something uh, that appeared to be a black snake uh, in in the the bowl where she was throwing up and things like this. So um, these are experiences that are really unparalleled, even amongst other hallucinogenic drugs. But but one of the the key studies with DMT that really caused a lot of attention, and this is this is one that really got my attention in this whole subject area, was a study that was done by Dr. Rick Strassman. A uh, psychiatrist, a clinical psychiatrist, back in 1991 uh, at the University of New Mexico, uh, funded by the federal government. They were formal clinical trials in hospital, well funded, uh, under tightly controlled conditions, and they were documented in a book called DMT: The Spirit Drug, which is a, a book that's still available. And I, I reviewed that book, and uh, they screened them out. Uh, a number of the subjects, uh, for example, had no knowledge of UFOs any kind of information like this. A few of them were prior drug users, so they could determine if this was like a common trip that they'd had before or something unique. The rest of them were not drug users. So they looked at these various facets. But what they found consistently was within seconds of intake, these subjects interacted, uh, these test subjects, with with creatures that resembled alien greys or reptilian creatures or even insectoid creatures. Uh, and reliably interacted with these kind of creatures. And in fact, these insectoids sounded like praying mantis or locusts, actually. Um, 
while the test subjects were there, they were even being interviewed while they were having this experience. So Dr. Strassman was talking to them, taking notes while they were encountering these entities. And they were aware that they were in two worlds. So they weren't lost out on one and in the other. And in fact, later in the experiments, they had to wear masks because they could see this other spirit world dimension, whatever you want to call it, overlaid over the existing world that we were at. And so they were aware that they were visiting, but everything in their experience said was this was not a trick of the mind, but this was something legitimate. Even the people who had taken drugs in the past said, no, this is actually real. I, before I could tell this, it was, it was some escape of my mind, but this was something real, a real contact. The, the, the ones who were willing to take repeated, uh, experiments, actually noticed that these creatures remembered their name, noticed how long they were gone. There was a complete understanding of a lapse of time, which they say never happens with other hallucinogens, doesn't happen in dreaming, things like this. So something that convinced the subjects that this was this was reality. Um, however, uh, in, in contact with these strange, bizarre creatures, uh, the, the subjects were commonly raped or had violent reproductive experiments done on them, uh, something that sounded very akin to what you hear in alien abduction experiments, uh, but but very very difficult thing. And in fact, many of the subjects were required to form a support group after the study for trauma therapy because they were so horrified by what they had experienced with it. But ironically, not only uh, does this DMT uh, ingestion process occur with indigenous tribes of Indians down in Central America, but there are now DMT churches. Churches that take it in a religious context, uh, they're all over Brazil, and I believe they're actually in America now. And uh, these uh, particular churches, uh, there was a court case uh, trying to get them to stop to take this particular drug, and they said that it was part of the religious observance, and I believe the U.S. courts recently upheld it as valid. So I would expect to see these churches actually spread throughout the United States. Now, um, there's very interesting elements. This is something that I, that I can't talk about from the narrative. You have to see it. But but someone has actually attempted to make some pictures of something representative to what they would experience. And, of course, in a two-dimensional picture, you can't represent what, what a real, full reality experience someone would be. But but the kind of things that they mentioned were, were all sorts of vivid, bright colors, things like... Um, linear type events that were distorted, like, uh, for example, a uh, piano, uh, a, a, a thing of piano keys that actually be distorted and contorted. They would see little demons, uh, little imps and demons that would watch them. Uh, and they mo- most of the time, every one of the, the people would see a cloaked figure, a, a cloaked figure that they took to be death that would have a skull for a face, but it would actually have eyes. Uh, actual eyes that would be following them and as they would go from one type of event to the next this creature would just sit and watch them through all of this but uh, uh, to sort of segue back to our uh, uh, physiological uh, causes for this uh, we're going to talk back to the pineal gland and I just want to start with a quotation from Hitler uh, th- this was uh, out of a uh, autobiography or a biography done by Herman uh, Rauschen, one of his close associates in his book, Voice of Destruction. Uh, he says, Hitler stated, Some men can already activate their pineal glands to give a limited vision into the secrets of time. Hitler also told Rauschen that a, quote, new man would be created using the visions and scientific knowledge already being transmitted through these men's pineal glands. So this this is something that's known to be something very special for pure particular period of time. Now, to further explain this pineal gland uh, that Dr. Strassman believes is directly connected to the production use of DMT, uh, the pineal gland is a gland uh, embedded in the center of your brain, uh, directly behind your forehead, almost right between your eyes, uh, surrounded by the brain, and it's called pineal gland because it is shaped like a little pine cone. looks just like a pine cone, about 6 to 8 millimeters in diameter, but uh, it, it's this pine cone shape. Uh, and it produces chemicals like serotonin, uh, DMT, and other 
similar tryptamine chemicals, serotonin, which uh, which affects your your general state of well-being, uh, melatonin, which is a derivative of ser- serotonin, is created in the pineal gland. Uh, one of the ironies, um, uh, just a little tidbits about uh, the pineal gland, is that fluoride in in water will actually calcify it. Uh, and you, that's why you can see a pineal gland on x-rays in older people that actually is calcified, which would tend to suggest that it would inhibit its capability, if whatever its capability might be. But as it turns out, in additional research I've performed uh, in, in the literature, it turns out fluorine actually assists the DMT and other tryptamine neurotransmitters in accomplishing their task. It allows it directly direct passage into the cells and into the nerve endings. So fluoride actually has been documented as a beneficial effect in having the pineal gland do what it does. Now, the cells in the pineal gland are the same kind of cells that you find in the retina in your back of your eye. Uh, in fact, it's called in other, some other animals, simple animals, the parietal organ. And the reason why is it functions literally as a third eye. Uh, it has a light sensitivity. It'll actually transmit information from light, really just like your eye does. Now, it may, may process it in a different way, um, but it actually takes light signals, converts it into something for the brain. And so it was considered a third eye in a number of uh, animals, uh, but ours is, is actually embedded, but it still has those kind of things. So it's considered a sensory organ. Uh, the Eastern world has often called it the third eye. So if you hear a New Age teaching about the third eye, and they usually put it right between your forehead, even you'll notice the Eastern world will put that little, little dot in India right there. It's right in the direction of the pineal gland. So they understand there's something going on there. Uh, one interesting author of the early 20th century, H.P. Lovecraft, who was the most prominent occult author, uh, he had a, a very famous book he wrote, a story called From Beyond. Uh, it was later made a movie. But uh, in this story, a machine was built that actually would would stimulate uh, people's pineal glands, people who came close to the machine, and would actually use that as a technique to send them into an alternate dimension. And these alternate dimensions were populated by very malevolent beings so that they could actually harm and even kill people that were there. So uh, he also was one who envisioned technology as a means by which to stimulate this pineal gland in a connection dimensionally. Uh, Rene Descartes, the famous mathematician and philosopher, he thought that the pineal gland was the physical portal to the spirit world. That was the place where everything going on in our, in our body and mind went through that point to connect somehow spiritually with God or, or whoever. Uh, now, something that, that I would propose is just a hypothesis, something for consideration, is that uh, neutralizing this action of the pineal gland, uh, I think, is a possibility that it might be part of what's alluded to by the flaming sword in Genesis uh, that actually keeps man away from the Garden of Eden and from partaking of the Tree of Life. Uh, this was initially just a hunch of mine uh, because there was such a close connection between mankind and the Garden of Eden and spirit beings, whether it be God or whether it be Satan or others. Now, obviously, man showed that he was incapable of being able to act responsibly in that kind of close environment. And my initial suspicions were that in addition to having a physical angel with a physical sword and a physical garden, that, that there was an additional representation there of some kind of protective block that God put to try to keep uh, our actions of using some kind of means of using our pineal glands to contact the spirit world and, and my suspicion was further augmented by the fact that these dark, fallen spirit beings came down shortly after the fall and began showing natural ways for men to actually use natural roots and things like this to overcome this barrier that was put in the body. Uh, this MAO, MAO, as I mentioned before, is present in your gastrointestinal system and will actually dissipate DMT unless you inhibit it and provide extra DMT. Uh, and in fact, that's what these particular roots do that, were, that have been used of old in folk religion, in Wicca, in, in activities like this. They were taught by these fallen angels, and I believe it was to get around what, what was involved in this protection, i.e. the flaming sword in Genesis to keep from the tree of life. Now, to further to support that, I did, I've done some research in that passage again. Uh, these flaming swords, along with the cherubim that were there, were placed to keep man from Eden 
and from the tree of life, or the place of, of, of God's presence, the place of, of the delights of spirit uh, contact and communication. Uh, cherubim were, were always seen in the scripture as God's guardians. Uh, and here they were guardians to protect the path of the tree of life. If you if you look at these words, you'll actually see it. It's a it's a path or direction that they are actually uh, inhibiting uh, in the Hebrew. Now, the word flaming uh, in this particular passage uh, in uh, Genesis chapter three is the Hebrew word. I believe it's pronounced lahat, and it the meaning of flaming. Uh, its primary use is to use occult or magical arts. It is a, an occult hidden from view meaning. Uh, which is very fascinating. Uh, in fact, that uh, that same word is only used in one other verse in the Bible, uh, and it is used to describe the enchantments of the Egyptian magicians. The Egyptian magicians, when they confronted Moses and they threw their their um, their rods down and they became snakes, the enchantments they used, uh, and and that self same word that the magicians described there, were ones who knew secret occult practices, according to the definition of the Bible. Uh, this enchantment was the same word used here for flaming. Now, the word uh, carab, I believe, uh, is pronounced, uh, is in fact representing a sword, a knife, or, uh, curiously, a tool for cutting stone. So the flaming sword described in this passage, that, that the sword, or the Hebrew word for the sword itself, can represent a, a sword or, or, or knife, but a tool for cutting stone, which makes me wonder, is there any connection to this ancient knowledge of stone cutting tools and, and Freemasonry and a connection of these tools being needed uh, to be overcome to reestablish this connection. The last word there uh, where it says that they it goes to and fro, waving to and fro, is a Hebrew word, uh, hifak. And that particular word actually means not only to go to and fro, but to transform oneself. So the the possible explanation of these Hebrew words uh, is possible that that this particular device used to inhibit our access to to the tree is something that is an occult or hidden means of using a a sword knife or some kind of uh, tool to transform yourself. So there's an inhibition of the transformation, and the discussion of of keeping it keeping the tree alive it says, is to inhibit or to restrain. So there is an activity of the cherubim to restrain uh, this activity, this occult activity or hidden activity, using tools by which to transform yourself. So I think that's very curious when we think about passages in the New Testament when it says that the man of sin will not be revealed until the restrainer is taken away, until he who restrains uh, and then will become apparent that, that he's there, one should be seen. So I'm not sure if there's a connection or not, but it's very curious. Uh, another case that actually a listener to Future Quake pointed out after one of our presentations mentions, and it may or may not have a connection here, but it is a, a curiosity. The, the, the incident in which Jacob wrestled with God, uh, and God blessed him, God touched the hollow of his thigh, but he wrestled, he faced him face to face. Jacob names that place Peniel, uh, P-E-N-I-E-L, slightly different spelling, Peniel, almost identical pronunciation. Could be just a coincidence. But the, the word Peniel in Strong's Concordance means, I have seen a divine being face to face, yet my life is preserved. And in fact, he recites this again in Genesis thirty-two thirty. So it sounds very similar to the kind of experiences that these people have had where they have seen beings they would call gods uh, and were in fear of their very life from this contact. Um, but he made it a name there, and whether there's a connection or not, I don't know. But uh, Peneo has a very uh, interesting history after that. Um, uh, it was picked as the headquarters of the northern kingdom of Israel at the time that they went into a cult worship and occult practices, and uh, set up idols, golden calves, idols for worship. They made that the head of the kingdom for the northern kingdom, this, this particular location. Now, um, pineal gland, uh, it's typically represented uh, as a pine cone in its representation because of its shape, and that leads to some very curious representations in ancient mythology and in art. Uh, if you look in the, the ancient followers of Osiris, 
you will actually see that he carries a shaft, uh, a rod or shaft that he carries with a pine cone on the top of the shaft. Uh, similarly, Dionysus, who was a liminal god or a god that controlled the contact between the spirit world and human world, who actually uh, had a process by which his followers entered an altered state via drugs to be able to make this contact in this ecstatic state, he was known by carrying a similar rod uh, that had a fennel shaft made out of fennel, uh, you know, the, the, the plant material, with a pine cone on top of it. And his followers, the maidens, the Maneads, actually would carry a similar staff with a pine cone on top. Well, it doesn't just end at the ancient world. If you look at pictures of, of uh, the popes, they actually carry a similar shaft that has a pine cone near the top of the shaft itself, the same kind of designation. And in fact, it goes even closer connection. If you go to the Vatican and you look in the Vatican Square, you will find an area called the Court of the Pine Cone at the Vatican. And they have there the largest pine cone statue in the world. And from my research, I suggest that it was actually taken from the nearby Temple of Isis. It was actually transported from there in the early days of the church uh, from that temple and put in the Vatican. Uh, and I've never seen any explanation from church figures on why a pine cone would be there or the significance of it. It may be there, but I don't. But it can't be more than a curiosity that this memory, ancient connected memory of a pine cone and its significance for contact with the gods is still present. Now, just discussing about some other chemicals. Uh, serotonin, which is a related neurotransmitter chemical, as I mentioned, serotonin, melatonin, DMT is a similar one. Serotonin is produced by the pineal gland and elsewhere in the body. It is synthesized by L-tryptophan. Uh, L-tryptophan is the base uh, p- product that these chemicals like serotonin and others are made from, even artificial chemicals that we now take. Serotonin affects mood, uh, increases aggressiveness, and even affects swarm behavior in locust, which is um, very in- interesting when we talk later about locusts. Uh, but, but general aggressiveness in people is a byproduct of its, of its uh, uptake. Uh, and in fact, it is present in the venom of wasps and stingers to in- increase pain. And there's a particular type of um, um, scorpion that was uh, in Israel, that's in Israel now, it's called something like a death scorpion. Um, it actually has serotonin in its, uh, in its particular venom in the scorpion, and it brings you almost to death. It is so severe. It, 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 it typically will not kill a healthy individual, but it brings them close to death because it is such a severe impact. Now, uh, tests that have been done, medical tests with serotonin, just, just administering that to people have shown that people can have religious experiences uh, or similar kind of or even obsessive compulsive disorder can come out of serotonin uptake. But uh, religious mystical events is, occur as well. Now, the, the artificial hallucinogen or entheogen chemicals, DMT, psilocybin, mescaline, LSD, they all interact with serotonin receptors uh, and basically replace its interaction. So they actually can go in and uh, when serotonin is low and actually replace it and, and do the same effect on the nerve receptors. Uh, most antidepressants that are taken are focused on altering serotonin levels for the same purpose. So th- this is a key in affecting who we are, how we perceive ourselves, and our reality itself. Now, here's another curiosity that I stumbled across, and again, it may not be connected at all, but when you hear the punchline at the end of this talk, I want you to remember this process. It, it, it may have some curious connection. Um, there is a process by which pine cones preserve their seeds, their internal seeds, to disperse until they're exposed to fire. When they're exposed to fire, they will release, have a sudden explosion and release their seeds to regerminate. Uh, and this process is called serotony. And serotony is the process, again, and it's used in, for example, forest fires. When, when a fire has raged through a thick forest and these burned pine cones will actually be activated by the fire to release their seeds to repopulate it. Um, I think there is a mystical connection there that hopefully I'll refer to in just a moment. I'll, I'll, let me pursue with an, another entheogen that has its 
own potential revelations. This is something that not too many people know about, but people are starting to find out about real quick, including myself. And this actually is an alcoholic drink, a spirit, ironically called a spirit, called absinthe. Absinthe is known by most people as the green fairy or the green goddess, and that's because in its normal state it has a pale green color. It is a highly alcoholic distilled beverage. Uh, its key ingredient that makes it absinthe is it uses a wormwood plant. And the the Greek name, the official plant name, excuse me, uh, Latin would be Art- Artemisia absinthium. Uh, and it also uses fennel uh, in it and a few other ingredients as well. And remember, we've already mentioned fennel and its connection with the pine cone and, and the, the, the staffs in the, in the spirit world. Uh, uh, but again, it has this pale green color, uh, and it makes this very special material, as you're going to hear. Now, absinthe was the obsession of European culture in the late 1800s. It actually has a connection far back to the ancient world. This wormwood-based alcoholic beverage uh, was actually known in the Greek world as absinthino, absinthonites oinos, or absinthe wine, and it was used in the worship of Dionysus. It was used to get them into an ecstatic state where the Menaeids would, would actually run, be totally filled with his presence, have contact with him, and at the same time, they would run, according to the ancient writers, run across the hillside. If they grabbed oxen or large animals, they would rip them apart, limb from limb, and then consume them while these animals were still living, consume the raw material. Uh, even humans, it was reported that they would actually do this too. They were a terror. Uh, and these, these were, were women, maidens that actually got together, went into the state. So it has ancient connections. It was even used for medicinal uses and things like this. But it's, it's, it's real golden age was in the late 1800s in Europe. It was very popular with the bohemian artist bad boys of the era that we, that we know well in literature. People like Oscar Wilde, Vincent van Gogh, Salvador Dali, Pablo Picasso, Manet, Hemingway, they all were voracious consumers of absinthe. And they all claimed that what was unique about it was that it connected them to their muse or their spirit being that would actually inspire them and tell them what to do in their artistic endeavors. Uh, many of these consumers, ironically, end up going mad later. They were actually left insane eventually due, due to the absinthe or, or other reasons. Uh, and not surprisingly, Aleister Crowley was obsessed with it. Uh, he, he actually consumed it in, of all places, New Orleans at a place called the Old Absinthe House. And he, he was, he just loved it. Of course, anything that would contact the spirit world, he was enamored with. And he wrote a poem, uh, about it called The Green Goddess. And actually the poem was, uh, was recited that the, 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 the person who was supposedly writing it was Apollo, the god Apollo. So I want you to remember that Apollo here is appealing to the virtues of the green goddess, and keep that in mind. Now, Marilyn Manson, who a person who has tried his best to, to keep the Aleister Crowley legacy of being the wickedest man alive and doing everything he can possible to uh, offend Christians and the Christian's God, uh, not surprisingly, he has found the... Uh, the joys of absinthe himself. In fact, one of his recent albums, he says, were was recorded and conceived, written while he was under the influence of absinthe. Now, the effect of consumption of absinthe was understood in society at the time to create a a condition they called absentheism, which was some kind of degraded physical state that is much much worse than alcoholism. And if you look at the slides and pictures, you will actually see some beautiful art from that era where you see this green goddess or uh, green fairy actually seducing men and just driving them to ruin, basically. Uh, as a result, in the widespread abuse of this chemical, it was banned in most of Europe, almost all of Europe and the United States, ironically, until just recently. Just recently, it's come back. Uh, and in my presentation, I actually have pictures of the uh, of of the screen fairy and the effects it has on men, uh, ironically, some of the art from that period of time actually shows um, them attempting to burn the screen goddess at the stake. But they see her rescued from a version of her in the skies, in the clouds in the sky. She's coming to the rescue. Now, 
this connection to absinthe and, and Artemis. Uh, Artemis, whose name, and, and it's acknowledged in the literature, in, in the naming of the wormwood uh, plant, uh, that it, it's referring to Artemis, the goddess. Okay, Artemis is also known in mythology as Diana or Hecate. And Artemis was the brother of Apollo. In fact, there's all sorts of art that's available that shows her with her with her brother Apollo as well. Uh, Hecate is another one who was associated with Artemis, or also Isis. And she's known as the goddess of witchcraft, and she is a liminal god, which means she controls the portals to the gods themselves. She's the doorkeeper uh, to to make it available, and in fact, she is associated. This this manifestation of this goddess, known as Hecate, this version is known to be associated with fire, with keys, and with sorcery. Are some of the key things associated with her? Now, it turns out in their in their history, this this myth and legacy that they've retained, she was the only Titan. Uh, or, you know, near godlike type figure, which some people associate the Titans even with the, the fallen angels, uh, that, that, that again I mentioned earlier for Revelation chapter 6. Many believe that the Titans are a legacy of, of these creatures in literature. She was the only Titan that was not banished to the abyss by, uh, by Zeus. And so, um, just like the the uh, these these fallen uh, sons of God, Benai Elohim, they were banished to Tartarus, and it ties to the legends of the Titans as well. But she was spared, uh, and what she was known for is she taught the use of plants and the use of drugs uh, to help in in witchcraft and in the sorcery activity, uh, and in uh, legendary writings, uh, famous literature like the Golden Ass. She is clearly stated to be the same one as Isis. Now, uh, to proceed further with this line of thought, um, l- let's go forward to Revelation chapter 8 and, and just take all we've learned here so far and look at what I'm saying as a hypothesis, a possible scenario. It's very different than what I've heard other people talk about, and I extend it only as a hypothesis to consider. Uh, it's not something I'm, I'm certain has connection, but it's worthy pondering. Uh, there, there, Revelation chapter 8 talks about the trumpet judgments. Okay, so these trumpets are blown. Every one of these trumpets has some association with one-third, or a one-third destruction as a result. And I'm under the presumption this one-third was intentional to relate that these judgments are pertaining to Satan's rebels. The original one-third that... Uh, rebelled along with him away from God, and that they're symbolic that all of their their workings and their ends on earth are being judged. We see the second trump occur in that passage, and the seas and the ships themselves are impacted. In fact, it's clear that they're talking about real oceans here. There's a big stone that goes down and hits the water like a meteor. It, it capsizes ships and destroys them, so it's a clear relationship. But there's a, there's a third trump that happens, and sometimes people confuse these two in what's happening. Um, but I don't believe it's a redundant punishment of the water. I think there's something else going on here. In verses 10 and 11, the third trump is blown, and it says a great star. The Greek word is aster, uh, and it's, it's described elsewhere in Revelation as being an angel. Uh, the word star is used for an angel that, that falls down. Okay, uh, and this angel falls, and it, its name is described as wormwood. Now, the the word, if you look it up, the Greek word, it's uh, G eight ninety four in in, uh, in Strong's. It's absinthion is the name of this particular what I believe is an angel wormwood, and in fact, it is a proper name. It says it's a proper name uh, in the Greek, and that it uses a feminine form. Now, I recognize gender can be very tricky in languages, and I'm not a linguist. So I know gender can not necessarily mean men or women, but it, it, it has language uses. But ironically, it mentions this feminine form, and it says it is burning like a lamp or a torch. Now, remember these uh, features of these mythological goddesses we've been talking about. They have an association with that. And it says they fall, just like Diana fell to Ephesus. They fall on a third of the rivers the f- and the fountains of waters. Now, these waters, the Greek word they're used is hydror. And the word hydror 
uh, one of the one of the uses of it is many peoples, and in fact, it's described more specifically in Revelation 17, where the same waters are used, and the angel explicitly explains to John that these waters represent peoples, multitudes, and nations and tongues. So I think it's altogether possible that the same word in the same book is meaning the same thing. It actually refers not to liquid water, which was referred to in the second trump, but a representation of these peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. As a result of that, in verse 11, it says a third of these waters, or possibly peoples, become wormwood, absintheon. Okay, so they, so they take on or they invoke this, this deity, uh, absintheon, or uh, uh, wormwood. And it says as a result, many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, again, if we're not looking at physical water here, and this word bitter is actually the Greek word pekeno. And pekeno uh, means to render an- angry or indignant. So I see a possibility that you have these followers that have actually taken on the spirit and become bitter or angry and indignant. And as a result of this effect, many people die because of what happens to those who this wormwood falls on. Uh also interesting to point out in this passage, in the first trumpet, you see trees are burned up. The second trumpet, you have seas attacked. In the fourth trumpet, you have one-third of the sun, moon, and stars, where there's no shining day or night for one-third. And as it turns out, uh, Diana, Artemis, Hecate, Isis are all goddesses of the forest, seas, sun, and moon. So these are the very elements that are described in these particular set of judgments that refer to the attributes uh, of this uh, uh, of this goddess itself. And in fact, I'll just mention further that Alan Moore and his protege Steve Moore, who uh, uh, are, are these well-known literature uh, people of today, they worship the goddess Selene. And it turns out Selene is a moon goddess that is equivalent to Artemis. So we still have this particular worship that still goes on today. Now, uh, the, the chapter 8 of Revelation ends with this narrative that I just described, and then the beginning of, ni- of chapter 9 starts with an angel who fell from heaven and who has keys. Now, this angel uh, is described in the, in the uh, King James as being a he, but when you look, I, I see no evidence of gender in the Greek uh, for the angular description. There's no male or female given, but uh, it has keys to open the abyss. And it releases who? Apollyon, uh, the Hebrew version of Apollo, and locust. So uh, I'm seeing a picture that's that's actually forming here. I think people can connect the dots uh, from this. I, I believe that it's possible that this wormwood, for example, the star who's thrown down uh, at the trumpet is the same star who carries these keys forward, particularly since this goddess is associated with carrying keys to the spirit world and to the underworld. So, so then, uh, this Apollo was released, who was the brother of Artemis. So, to, to just, uh, solidify the interpretation, uh, that I'm leading with this, uh, this hypothesis would suggest that Artemis slash Hecate slash Isis, whoever this liminal goddess is, she's, she falls down in fire, as she's described, comes down in fire, she empowers her followers as a result, which is really a, a satanic knockoff of Pentecost. So they are actually empowering their followers just like the church was initiated at Pentecost. And as a result, there is a massive worldwide human sacrifice, blood sacrifice that ensues with the many people that die. Uh, these followers uh, that have had the spirit come upon them, they, they become bitter, they, they become rage, they kill in mass. Uh, and as others who study this uh, subject matter say, that there is an incredible occult power and strength in sacrifice, particularly human sacrifice. So if this is done on a worldwide scale, it may provide the sufficient power for this abyss to actually be opened and, and the keys itself. So uh, I would not be surprised if this is done in some kind of semi-ritual process where they'll be released in a type of ritual to, to do this in the process of unleashing her, her brother Apollo. Uh, which I would call in the vernacular of Pastor Estizdar the open, ultimate black awakening of humans. Now, in Revelation 9, at the end of this passage, after the abyss opens and these locusts come out, and you remember what I said that uh, um, 
that that serotonin, one of the key chemicals in the pineal gland, uh, actually uh, creates swarm behavior in locusts. And you know these locusts are actually released. And actually it's a key ingredient in their stingers, particularly in these very deadly scorpions in the Middle East. Uh, and as we know, we, we hear that these stingers that they have are stingers like scorpions that attack people for five months. And these people, uh, it, it's almost like they're paralyzed, almost like a a um, sleep paralysis or some kind of alien abduction event where people are frozen and can't move. It says they seek death, but they can't find it because of this terrible venom like from scorpions. And and this may add to to the uh, the torture and the agony of it. Uh, but it says after all this is experienced and all of the creatures come out of the abyss and do this to, to the worldwide population, the Bible says that even then that the people would still not repent of their sorcery of their or their murders after all this torment. So there again there's a connection to sorcery or the practice of rituals to invoke gods, uh which I think is connected to the events that just occurred that were there, as well as the murders that occurred, which they did on a massive scale. And so it leads me to believe that it's possible that they may have actually personally invoked the falling of wormwood on purpose. So what we see in Revelation eight may be an event that happens by these followers, maybe under the direction of the false prophet, but as a result, the spirit comes down and dwells people, and what happens from there, they may not be totally expecting, but uh, they, they, they get what they ask for. Now, here, here's some a, a little extra additional information uh, I've come across, and this is just a brief summary. I have a lot more information to, to, to discuss some of this. I'll give you one example in, in current uh, culture, our, our current society, where some of this information touches us. And this is new information I have out, still checking. Um, there was a hospital established uh, in the 20th century called the Charlestown Hospital, Charlestown's Hospital, uh, and it was known as something that called the Belladonna Treatment for Alcoholism. And what happened, there was, a, there was some mysterious man who approached this person, Charles Towns, who was not a doctor, by the way, and approached him with a mysterious recipe of drugs, uh, that natural drugs that be given to people to cure addictions. And they said that it would be certain to make a lot of money. Uh, this mysterious person came, gave the instructions, and left without any trace. Uh, and it's very interesting because when this was tried, it was first tried on criminals, the underworld figures, criminals who were, who were uh, overwhelmed with opium and other kind of uh, addictions, cocaine. And then the federal government approved it to be used on millions of people in China, who obviously had a lot of opium addicts. So it was used in mass on large parts of the population. Uh, this same gentleman, even though he wasn't a medical doctor, assisted in developing the early national drug laws that our country is, is still under. Now, what makes it really interesting is when you know what the Peladonna cure comprises. This particular cocktail of drugs that were given over time used belladonna, which is also known as deadly nightshade, uh, shade, henbane, which, which contains chemicals like hyoscyamine, uh, which is also known by scopolamine, which we've talked about, and also hyoscyamine, which is also in henbane and mandrake. Uh, all these chemicals, by the way, if you've noticed and heard of them before, the, these these natural uh, herbs, uh, belladonna, nightshade, hidden bane, have all been used by witches for untold periods of time, for potions. Uh, even in Shakespeare and things like that, you can hear some of these chemicals used. Folk medicine has used them, and I believe it's all the way back from the fallen angels who were taught that these particular root drugs. But this was given in a modern medical hospital facility to cure addictions like alcoholism. And one of the curiosities of this was that henbane, one of the drugs there, is known uh, when you when you take it, ingest it, for causing sensations of flight. Where you actually feel like you're flying. And there are some theories that this is how uh, the rumors got in the, in the myths about uh, witches actually um, flying. And in you know, broomsticks and things like that, was because they would take in their covens, they would take this henbane, and they would actually take it in mass and uh, think that they were flying. Okay. So, this belladonna treatment, all of a sudden this man uh, initiates somebody, uh, 
money becomes available to put this hospital together. One of the early people who comes up to attempt this treatment is a gentleman by the name of Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson is a drunk at the time, but he will become the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, he, just before this period of time, got to know some people called the, the Oxford Movement, which was a Christian movement but has some very, very dark background to it as well, too. And that had a lot of effects on his work as well, too. But that's, that's for a whole other story, talking about the Oxford Movement. But he goes to this hospital for this very bizarre treatment of giving these ancient uh, drugs. Uh, and during his hospital uh, uh, treatment, he says he had a mystical experience with God. And this was the experience that he talked about for the rest of his life. He said he had a sensation of flight, which is obviously from the henbane, uh, and this experience of being set on a mountaintop. And his exclamation was, if, if this is the God of the preachers, then I accept it. Uh, or something to that effect. So he associated that with what he referred to as God or higher power to later state to what he experienced. Now, he, he had very interesting life that many people don't know about. Um, he said that he, um, he actually channeled the 12 steps uh, that he wrote about in his book from a 15th century monk uh, from the resources I have. And this is because he maintained an interest in spiritual spiritualism the rest of his life. Uh, but, but he says this came from this other intelligence uh, that provided this information. Uh, and in fact, his biographer said that he had something in his house called the spooky room at his home where they would go do uh, seances or Ouija board uh, activity. And so they were definitely into that. Uh, he also got really involved in the consumption of LSD. Uh, and he was part of a study group uh, back in the 50s and I guess 60s, uh, studying its use for assistance. Uh, people who assisted him were Aldous Huxley, a gentleman who has also a very sordid past from Brave New World and his plan to actually keep most of the world's population drugged on Soma. It's talked about in his writing, his globalist writings that he had of an elite running over a drug populace. People like Gerald Hurd, who I've since learned was one of the earliest prominent New Age teachers in America uh, in consciousness expansion. Even Claire Booth Lucci, who was uh, a, a congressional figure, female congressional figure, whose, whose husband operated the, the uh, Time magazine. So a very interesting group. But he mentioned in this consumption of LSD that the experience he had was, was basically identical to his religious experience he had in that hospital, which is what he considered his contact with God. Now, uh, coming here toward the end, I just want to share a little bit about what's coming, what we think is coming. Here is a quotation I'm going to give from one of the most prominent New Age uh, leaders, Barbara Marks Hubbard. She's a, a woman who actually narrowly missed... Uh, getting the vice president nomination for the Democratic ticket in 1984. Uh, very influential person, particularly in global circles, uh, and, and even with some evangelical figures, believe it or not. Uh, she had a message that she said she channeled from her spirit, and here's what the message she was given. It says, uh, this is her spirit guide speaking. It says, out of the full spectrum of human personality, one-fourth is electing to transcend. One-fourth is destructive and they are defective seeds. Now as we approach the quantum shift from the creature human to the co-creative human, the human who is the inventor of godlike power, the destructive one-fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Fortunately, you are not responsible for this act. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. He selects, we destroy. We are the riders of the pale horse death. So this this is a plan of uh, spiritual rumble that's planning in our future. Um, I spoke at a conference that was sponsored by the United Nations and World Council of Churches uh, that is a, a non-governmental organization, NGO, sponsored by this group, creating a new world religion called the Order of the Transfiguration. And the conference, international conference I spoke at in 2008 had the theme of reconnecting heaven and earth. And the theme, as they described it off the brochure, says that they will be discussing new sciences of consciousness and healing, which could potentially reconnect the worlds of spirit and space in the human psyche. And this is, again, what's being underwritten by the United Nations. And the cover of the brochure has a goddess 
who actually has the earth in one hand and has these stars in the other hand, uh, where she's reconnection, reconnecting the stars to earth itself as a type of liminal goddess. Now, a uh, couple more points. Uh, there's another interesting character, and this, this person goes back to the time of the Babylon working with Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard. The, the female who they say that they conjured or conjured her appearance suddenly, uh, from an earlier magical work than they did was a woman by the name of Marjorie Cameron. She assisted them in the Babylon working in 1946, January, with the goal of releasing the whore Babylon, which they were planning to be the consort for Horus, or the Antichrist, which was the resurrected Osiris. Ironically, she referred, re- referred to herself later, and she was very prominent after this event. She she starred in movies by the occult filmmaker uh, Kenneth Anger. She was a main star of it. She was a head of occult circles the rest of her life. But she referred to herself as a female as the Wormwood Star. So she clearly saw a female personification in their internal teaching to a fem- feminine personality known as Wormwood and as a star itself. Uh, just another quick comment, uh, back in Acts, Acts chapter 19, the chaos at Ephesus. Uh, I mentioned this black awakening connection, and I think people can read that to see if there's anything to this mass invocation of demonic spirits in people, that there's sort of a, uh, a, a initial run of it in Acts 19 when you see how the people were taken over and almost cost the life of Paul and his followers, uh, chased them into the arena, if I can remember right, or the amphitheater at the time. So, um, in closing, I just want to say that I'm putting a further hypothesis here that, that this leads me to suspect that there are plans that are being prepared for a future mass evocation of this, this wormwood god or goddess. And there's three aspects that appear to me from the literature that are required to have a successful mass evocation. The first, uh, it, it, it helps with to have the use of drugs to chemically assist humans in establishing contact and opening portals to the spirit world to actually overcome whatever limitations we have, uh, to any barriers to overcome them. Uh, and I, I would say that if you do some studying in this, you will find, and you're probably already aware, most of you, that a very large por- portion of our population is already on mood-enhancing or reality-altering drugs. Many of these are, in fact... Uh, tryptamine-based products uh, that affect our neurotransmitters and in many ways are very, very close cousins, very similar in their look to serotonin, to DMT, and similar chemicals itself. Uh, and their their chemistry is just, just very, very close to hallucinogens and their effect on neurotransmitters. The long-term effects of these chemicals, since they're, they're, they're really so many of them are new in this generation, are not understood but they have documentation where some of these drugs have, have gone and had the opposite effect at a later date unexpectedly of psychotic events that result in suicides, that result in um, death events of people. And even some of the mass shootings which we've had, and some of these shootings at schools and things, they have later found out that some of these chemicals, these people were on them and suspected that that exacerbated an event that caused this, this effect. Um, now, I also want to uh, make sure people are aware that it's not just drugs that you take that can cause this. This also includes foods. Uh, and we are surrounded by an atmosphere of genetically modified foods. Uh, you know, our corns and soybean are almost 100% genetically modified. Other drugs or other foods are in this case. Uh, also, the water we t- take. Uh, I heard uh, Brother Chris's comment about my water here. Fluoride is in a large portion of the population. Um, and further study, by the way, I did on fluoride shows that it does have an assisting effect. Uh, one would think because of this calcification process in the pineal that it actually inhibit its performance. But uh, other literature I found that, that fluoride chemicals can actually help take these particular drugs and transmit them uh, and get them through to the neurotransmitters. They help facilitate their, their function. Uh, uh, but our prescription drugs, prescription drugs right now are probably the most abuse drugs for uh, hallucinogenic experiences or even religious experience for things that aren't illegal. Uh, sometimes they're prescription, sometimes they're over-the-counter, but those are being used right now. And, and to keep an open mind on what we ingest as being possible use for sorcery, I'd just like to remind our listeners that 
what did Satan offer Eve for her first uh, experience like this, her first mystical experience to be illumined and no knowledge? It actually was a food. Uh, he gave, he, he uh, suggested she eat a particular food, uh, and this would open eyes and help her see good and evil. So it's not just chemicals you take. It can be foods and other things that have this effect. The second leg of the, the triad for massive vocation are rituals. And rituals are events like you, you picture for magic spells and, and activities that occur. My, my hypothesis and my suggestion is, is that uh, rituals, are, the reason why they're a key component to the evocation is they have some kind of effect in focusing faith. That there's some human, uh, further human limitation in being able to stay focused in the spirit world and rituals assist humans in being able to stay focused. And, and that's why the, the Bible is very, very careful, I believe, about graven images. Because graven images can actually serve that function of focusing faith in bad directions. And that's why uh, icons, I think, are, are a real danger. Uh, any kind of graven images like this that can focus faith, one has to be careful on uh, because what one might accomplish with it. Uh, and I believe these rituals are already going on in our mass media. I think we're already becoming acclimated. Um, in fact, that probably leading the charge amongst the media are our movies and our music. Uh, for doing overt uh, pagan occult rituals uh, in our music with our top artist in our in our movies as well too. If you see sneak previews in the movie theater, almost every one of them are about some kind of occult activity, and and such activities are ongoing. Uh, in fact, we've even gotten young people acclimated through Harry Potter and other things to make this just sort of a normal part of what's going on. Uh, but then we have TV. TV is doing the same thing too. I mean. Uh, we have video games that actually have these kind of activities. And even if you look at single events like Super Bowl halftime shows and things like this, these kind of events are happening over and over again, acclimating us for this importance of rituals. And in fact, I would just go back just to give you another example to the, the days, the early days of Nazism, uh, when they would have these Nuremberg demonstrations. Those were carefully constructed rituals to focus people's faith in Hitler, and this ancient belief system that he was selling. And so we're being prepared in a similar similar form, I believe. Now, the last leg of the triad are willing subjects that are willing to invite the spirit or host. Uh, I believe God puts a protective barrier for those who do not want contact with the spirit world. Um, usually, uh, when we are harassed by demonic spirits, it's because we've allowed some portal that we've opened a door for them, whether... It's a Ouija board or other occult activities or things like this. And so they need to get the population more willing to invite these hosts. And I believe that there is a major PR effort, public relations, that have been going on for decades in our society and our media to create sympathy for the devil and for other dark forces. And a couple examples I would use are uh, TV shows like Fallen on ABC, which actually showed a fallen Nephilim that was trying to get redemption. Uh, this movie, Legion, which actually showed Michael the Archangel rebelling against God on our behalf because in their storyline, God wanted to destroy us along with Gabriel and Michael comes to, to fight God on our behalf. Uh, even shows like Medium, uh, which put a happy face on these kind of activities of connecting with the spirit world. Uh, and I think you will find for other people who don't fall for these kind of things that there are more subtle things, very kind, gentle, light worker type new age uh, activities, envir the environmental movement, uh, Masonic activities, Masons, yoga, martial arts. These all can be uh, seemingly unassuming adult entryways into inviting, uh, becoming acclimated and inviting portals. Uh, for these kind of evocations. And I just want to point out here that, that, um, human assistance in this process of, of, of bringing forth these three, three aspects may not always even come from willing or even witting subjects that are aware of what they're doing. There can be, um, you know, many executives and movies and television, and other kind of things and publishing who aren't aware of this kind of stuff and do not realize they're even promoting it. Not every one of them wears a cape and horns in, in, in the back, although there are some that do. Um, I, I would submit that probably uh, 
most Americans that aren't Christians, their, their, their basic gods mostly are Mammon and Bacchus. Uh, they worship money and they worship um, um, pleasure uh, and anything that, that they, they find uh, fun or fulfilling. But they can be well, uh, un, unaware or subject to help promote this uh, activity. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say that uh, in summarizing, drugs play a key role in opening portals and contacting the spirit realm. And, and not all, but many, uh, but not all of them are hallucinations, and many of them are well documented that cannot be explained by just mere hallucinations. Uh, the consumption of substances with psychotropic properties are becoming increasingly significant uh, in their impact in recent days. Uh, some are done wittingly, some unwittingly uh, in this process. Uh, and again, there's new developments as far as additives to our food and water to expand it. Uh, and this evocation scenario that I've shown here uh, even a, a black awakening response by the subjects can even be consistent with, with at least one biblical interpretation or understanding of these passages. Um, there are actions, I believe, now behind the scenes right now to prepare for this event, that it is premeditated and being planned, and that uh, I do not know Christians may or may not be around to see this event when it occurs. Uh, but I would submit, even if we're not, it is the impact is already happening in society with the number of people who are succumbing to uh, the spiritual impacts of drug consumption and, and, and other kind of occult activity, and as well as the increase in psychotic uh, violence that's occurring. So uh, the final actions to take to close this, uh, actions to take in response, I suggest, one is control the substances you and your family ingest. Uh, and that requires, and that's all materials, uh, uh, drugs, food, anything you take. And that requires education, a substantial commitment on your behalf for education, uh, it, tempered by reasonableness and balance. Uh, one can become paranoid in the subject, so you've got to be reasonable, but uh, be smart, be informed in your decisions, and, and invest the time to be aware of what you ingest. Now, not only the physical intake but also the intellectual and spiritual intake as well. So control the audiovisual programming, and where that programming is for a purpose, that you and your family are exposed to. Uh, and I believe that's not just limited to what we're used to of, of controlling profanity, sex, and violence uh, as being dangerous to, to our families, like, for example, kids' shows and things like that. I think if you watch... Um, some of the children's shows today, there are psychedelic em uh, elements and even magical elements that, that don't register necessarily in pr profanity or violence or sex, may not even be kicked up with, uh, with protective software, but you need to be aware of the worldview that you're being, uh, being taught to your children. Uh, I also think that you should talk to your children, even if they're older teenagers, about uh, a real Christian worldview, a real one, uh, in a Christian perspective of what is being expressed in the culture media. You will not be able to totally sh uh, shield them from exposure if they're going to school, if they're around other friends. Uh, but what you can do is, is be ahead of the curve and instruct them about what they're being prepared and what they understand. And what you will find is that it will not be a turnoff to your children. They will actually be fascinated by the material similar to what's been in this presentation, and some of the radio shows like uh, Brother Chris's show and things, they will be fascinated to hear about this. And it will be a way for you to connect with your, with your youth uh, about this. And uh, you can also fill the void. If you have to limit certain entertainment and other content that they can have, um, there can be some very interesting Bible study that goes on, uh, sharing with Christians. And there's even some fiction, some action fiction and things like this that are done by Christian uh, from enlightened Christians about these topics that can actually uh, have healthy understanding for them and something that can actually fascinate them. And uh, also, I think you should take time to warn family uh, and friends, churchgoers, and the public. Uh, many of them will not understand when you tell them about the information we've covered here. Even Christians, um, it will be too overwhelming for them. Uh, but I recommend that everybody listening here take the risk anyway to share this information with people you know, and hopefully they will appreciate it later. And uh, I'd like to quote a passage as the final word here um, that, that maybe you could consider in a different light from what you had before, given what we've covered right now. This is from Second Thessalonians 2, chapter, verses 7 and 8. 
uh, and I'm going to I'm going to include the Greek uh, words in here with uh, some definitions, part of uh, some of the alternative definitions within Strong's Word. It says for mysterion or mysteries, religious secrets which are confided only to the initiated and not ordinary mortals. For mysterion of iniquity doth already work. Only arti, uh, Greek arti, which means now at this time, uh, katecho, kateko, uh, which means that which hinders the Antichrist from taking his appearance. Only now at that time, that hindrance uh, is occurring until genomai, uh, which means to arise, to appear in history, come upon the stage, uh, will come out of the uh, mesos, or the midst. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall do- destroy the brightness of his coming. So, this this passage can be read to say that these mysteries or religious secrets, confided only to the initiated, uh, pertaining to iniquity, are already at work. And only now at this time, that which hinders the Antichrist from making his appearance uh, is is occurring until it arises where it appears in history, comes on the world stage, out of our midst, and then the wicked one will be revealed. And I think this is consistent with the discussion narrative we've had today. And that concludes my presentation, uh, Brother Chris, on this information on spirit portals and drugs.